Thank you for coming to our panel. Uh, I'm Rachel Levy. I'm a reporter at the Wall Street Journal where I cover hedge funds. Um, to my right is Garage. Did I say it right? That's right. Okay. Um, Evan from Quandle and Michael from M Science. If we could maybe start, if you could tell me a few lines about you know, what you do and um, you know, what, what brings you to this panel, essentially. Sure. Thank you. I'm um, with State Street. Uh, I'm with a group called State Street Veris. I'm the head of data science, risk, and market intelligence. And uh, primarily what, you know, a little bit my, my background is, is primarily in uh, portfolio management uh, as a trader, portfolio manager, strategist, uh, also as a risk officer across hedge funds. Uh, I gravitated toward uh, machine learning data science in part due to my interest and background and uh, ended up at State Street for the last few years developing a AI and ML based platform that uh, really uh, uses a lot of unstructured data to find connections between uh, broad sets of unstructured inter information and portfolios. Hi, I'm the uh, head of data strategy and data sourcing for Quandle, and some of you may or may not know who that is. So uh, I assume you've all heard of NASDAQ. Uh, NASDAQ purchased Quandle at the end of last year, and Quandle is an alternative data platform uh, devoted to delivering content to really all facets of the financial services industry. Uh, prior to joining Quandle, I've been there for a couple months now, uh, spent about five years running data for Blue Mountain Capital, a large multi-strategy head fund out of New York. <clears throat> Mike Morale with M Science. Uh, thanks for having us. Thanks for Doc, and good to see you all again. Uh, I'm the CEO of a company that focuses on data-driven research and analytics. Our core client base is investors, and that ranges everything from hedge funds to mutual funds, any sort of asset manager. Uh, insurance companies, we have a private equity facing division, uh, and we also have a small corporate facing business. Our business model is essentially sourcing unique types of data, <clears throat> doing a lot of uh, building a lot of technology around each individual data set and setting it up for our research team. So uh, at the end of the day, what we're producing is intelligence, we're producing insight, uh, we have written reports, and we also have a data visualization platform. Uh, everything is curated, however, for the investment professional. So we like to think that uh, we're a technology-enabled research company. We're also an insights company, uh, and we deliver a finished product. Great. So we have an array of viewpoints here. We have buy side. We have, um, which I think will be interesting to hear from uh, from all of you. I wanted to start by asking, generally speaking, if you can if you can talk a little bit about how data has changed in this industry. We've been talking about data for several years now, specifically alternative data. Um, I'm curious uh, if you are seeking new types of data sources, if, you know, what, what do you think are sort of a high level, what is changing in this space? I'll start. Yeah. Uh, so I've been managing M Science for seven and a half years right now. When I first started, I thought it was gonna be the next big thing. It took about four or five years for it to actually really become a big deal. Um, meaning like, I'd say early to mid 2017, everyone woke up to the fact that there's value in data when it's applied to the investment research process. Uh, in the last two and a half to three years, we've gone from having 10 data partners to now 48 data partners. And each data partnership, as I mentioned earlier, requires a a pretty large technology build and a lot of, uh, yes? When you say data partnership, is it data partnership with an um, asset manager or with the provider? Uh, these would be data partnerships with some sort of entity that has data that we determine to be of value for our process of insight generation. And so when you ask if we're looking for new sources or types of data, absolutely. Uh, just this year alone, we've brought on about seven new partners. Uh, we've entered into new sectors, such as industrials, uh, new parts of TMT and consumers, such as enterprise software. We've actually figured out ways now to, 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 to give our clients visibility into how enterprise customers are interacting with each other. This is an industry that kind of grew up uh, B2C, 
And so we really view any way into B2B visibility as kind of the next frontier in what we're doing. Uh, and then we have plans underway to build out healthcare. So we've already hired a healthcare research team. Uh, now we're analyzing uh, and testing about 13 different data sets in healthcare. So sometime in the middle of next year, we'll be in the market with, with healthcare solutions. I mean, when I think back to the last, <clears throat> I don't know, maybe like seven to 10 years in data, um, you know, I always think about like a hedge fund or any investment fund is basically they're a factory that makes trades. And historically, you had the guys that ran the machines, and they took in kind of standardized input from exchanges such as NASDAQ, from standardized data providers like Reuters and Bloomberg. And basically, everybody was dealing with the same hamburger meat, and they cooked good hamburgers, and they came out the other side. Now you go to a burger joint in New York, and they have like artisanal grass-aged cows that are you know, especially loved for 300 years, and they have the impossible vegetable burger and all these kinds of things. Really, data's done much the same thing, that you're starting to see a real, in the last number of years, people bringing in really differentiated stuff, and it turns out even if you don't make such a good hamburger at any given day, if you're bringing in this better tasting input, you end up with better tasting output. And so I think the biggest change is, to drag the burger analogy even further, <laughs> as people now, there's like 19 different kinds of, of, of vegetable-based hamburgers. Now you're seeing bigger people get into the market and bringing data that you wouldn't have seen before. And so as it becomes more accepted and people are saying, ah, this is a thing, we get it. The providers that are bringing data to the marketplace are increasingly more interesting. You're seeing people coming up with new and more involved use cases for how to work with it. And also the amount of work you need to deal with it is getting decreased because of firms like M Science, because of firms like Quandle. Um, it used to be that in order to work with alternative data or any sort of data, you needed a team of data engineers, you needed a team of data scientists, you needed a whole infrastructure. Now with developments in the cloud and offshoring and various, again, platforms such as ours, there's a lot less overhead that you need to actually work with information like this. And that's really a big change because it's making it more accessible and that continues to get more and more quick and more and more able for more and more firms to work with this kind of information. And that just increases the likelihood that more people will bring more data to the marketplace as it's easier for people to work with it and consume it and derive insights from it. Yeah, I agree, agree with all those points. I mean, fundamentally, the the uh, volume, variety, and velocity of data uh, continues to increase and has increased substantially over the past several years. Uh, you know, I remember reading one statistic that the amount of media storage uh, necessary for the data that's produ produced in a single year is on the order of 700 or so exabytes. And, you know, over the next several years, we're, you know, it'll have to increase by zettabytes, several, you know, probably several hundred zettabytes, which are enormous numbers. Uh, that in of itself you know, uh, presents several challenges because uh, on the part of users, it's very difficult to sift through vast you know, array of data. Um, you know, how do you, as, as uh, Evan mentioned, uh, although the, the uh, platforms and the infrastructure are available to uh, cleanse the data, all the pre-processing work is much more efficient now than it used to be, it's still a lot of data. And it's difficult to distinguish between good sets of data versus you know, sets that don't really end up increasing alpha, but are very correlated with other sets of data. So a lot more data, but I think also a lot more effort needed uh, to find out those unique sets, uh, which actually can help generate alpha. I would just add to that that uh, several years ago, we had a data sourcing team, somewhere around a half dozen people globally. Uh, we actually take a lot of incoming calls now. We still have a data sourcing team. They're still very active, but a lot of the work that we do now is about picking between, you know, we, we don't want to waste time. And every time we really embark upon a testing phase or process or val uh, uh, process of validation or verification, it, we're, we're not doing it on another data set. So it's really important that we pick our spots and there's just an overabundance of options available right now, and I think the buy side is feeling that as well. In, in what way? So we have some clients that have anywhere from 200 to 500 uh, different vendors mm -hmm. selling them some sort of data. Typically, it's narrowly focused, but uh, I think there's been, I think we've, we're coming out of, on the other side, but we've definitely, we went through a period of oversupply, uh, I'd call it over the last, uh, 12 to 18 months where everyone decided that they had a unique data set and everyone decided that that unique data set needs to cost anywhere from 100 to $250,000 just because it's a round number. 
Uh, and I think that the market itself is, is weeding out where the value is, and that, that's showing up uh, with some companies going away or maybe limiting their ability to continue to source funding uh, or some consolidation. Okay. So a few years ago, I remember, I, I've, talked, I've known you for a, a while, I remember we talked about um, so like a high level, what kind of data can you access? And oftentimes the kind of common example would be satellite data and, and tracking you know, where cars are in parking lots or credit card data. All of you sort of hinted that the data sourcing has changed, it's gotten a little bit more, uh, maybe narrow, is that, if, that's, if that's fair to say. Um, so I'm curious sort of what kinds of new data sets are you able to access now in 2019 that you weren't able to three, four years ago? So I think Michael alluded to it in saying that they're bringing on a healthcare team. I think, you know, when you think about spaces that have literally an infinite amount of data, and there's always sort of been this thought that if somebody could parse all of the healthcare data there is and derive good insights, you'd probably know more about it than the healthcare industry itself knows. Because it is just, I mean, there's so much information. Figuring out how to work through that, and obviously there's a number of issues around HIPAA and, and privacy and, and a million real concerns there, but there is just so much information and it's figuring out how to parse that and work with it and do interesting things with it. Um, I think in some cases it's about moving past use cases that sort of seemed like they made a lot of sense and maybe have been superseded by other ones. So a few years back you sort of alluded to, you know, there were a lot of people with phone data with geolocation information and I don't think I'm, you know, exaggerating to say, I'm probably rounding down, there were like 50,000 different providers of data. Each one of them was like, we have 12 apps worth of information. Um, and the question became, were they actually saying anything incremental and how would you work with that? And I think as people get smarter about using it and choosing their time more wisely, as again, Michael alluded to, uh, it's about figuring out how to narrow down those cases and say, what are they actually saying? What's really meaningful? What are the spaces we can talk about? Any sort of business to business interaction is very interesting. And at the same time, you know, we're seeing this happening in other geographies. So I think, you know, from the point of view of, of an investment manager, very often you'll talk to folks and they'll say like, we want data for the US and we want data for China and we want data for Europe. Two of those places are countries and the third one is a collection of countries. And mm -hmm. so getting data for Europe is not the same thing as getting data from China or the United States. You might not have heard, they all speak different languages there. So like things are all crazy and there's different regulatory schemes and everybody's doing all kinds of different things. So aggregating that kind of information presents its own unique challenges and every place in Europe isn't interesting. You can get Liechtensteinian data, but that probably isn't something everybody wants so much. So it's about figuring out how to work through those different issues and build useful, interesting products, not just for Alpha, but also for other products like risk and, and all the other tasks that go along with the investment process. That's becoming more interesting. And I think those use cases continue to be evolving as, as time goes on. Yeah, I would say there's, uh, there's definitely many more types of data than there ever used to be. And I suspect, suspect that'll continue to increase over time. You, know, you mentioned geospatial data, you know, geolocation data, um, broad array types of imaging data, you know, speech-related data, text-related data. Speech, sorry, uh, speech-related data? You know, when pre-processing speech, uh, you know, streams of speech and trying to understand how that type of unstructured data can be you know, used for sentiment analysis, things like that. Huh. Uh, so there's, there's, um, there's an incredible amount of work, I think, uh, on the part of ven you know, vendors, and there's always a uh, large number of vendors increasing who are really trying to find unique sets of data uh, that you know don't, don't, don't necessarily exist in, in the domain right now. Um, but I suspect that there's just, a, you know, the healthcare is, is an enormous space and, and I, you know, I don't think the amount of data that's available from that space is, is, uh, is anywhere near what it could potentially be, uh, you know, hit the concern, uh, concerns aside. But there are just many, many uh, domains in which the amount of data is probably going to increase. But I, I think that the, the challenge is still, there's, you know, with all the incoming sets of uh, data, are, is there any value being added? I mean, is it data, is the insights you can extract from a new set of data incrementally better than what you're already using? And that, I think, is, uh, will be an increasing challenge uh, because there's, you know, there's, I mean, there's only so many types of data which, you know, can probably add value. And that, that set is probably much smaller than, than people think. So I, I have a question about the healthcare data. So it sounds like, if I'm understanding this right, this is sort of a new or area for asset managers to be able to touch into, if I'm getting that right. Um, but you, you also brought up privacy concerns. So how, 
what kind of data essentially can you potentially access um, that doesn't have privacy concerns related to healthcare? Yes, I think that's the reason it's new, because it's always existed. Uh, maybe companies needed some time to structure it, but I think companies that are uh, now making their data available needed a lot of time to get through the legal side of it. And so that's, I think, why it's finally uh, coming onto market, because these legal departments are you know, incredibly focused on compliance, and it's, it's, it's probably the most he heavily regulated industry that we, you know, that, that we operate within. Uh, I mean, some of the more popular types of data that are becoming available in healthcare would be claims data. So the ability to see uh, which types of doctors are performing which types of procedures on which types of patients based on their, depending on their diagnosis, uh, the frequency at which they're doing that, uh, and the, the cost at which they're doing that. So claims data provides the opportunity to actually see uh, not what the doctor or uh, the, the facility is charging or asking for, but what they're actually being reimbursed for, which is what translates directly into revenue. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also a good way to see uh, how, how drugs perform when they, let's say when they go, when they come off patent. And it's also a really interesting way, that, or an interesting use case is to see when doctors are prescribing certain drugs off-label. Because if, if enough doctors prescribe something off-label, then the opportunity exists uh, for the company, the manufacturer of the drug, to petition the FTA to ask for a broader use case for a drug, which can dramatically expand the revenue opportunity. Mm -hmm. So that's what we've seen so far. Um, major undertaking, though, because these data sets are, are, are massive. I mean, uh, tens of millions of Americans and every single visit, procedure that, that, that occurs, we're, we're, we're ingesting. So that's why I say we're probably not going to be in the market with, with a solution for our clients until the middle of next year. So is, is this data coming from like insurance providers or like, who would have that kind of data that can then be accessed? So it's similar to how we've operated within consumer and TMT over the years. We, we don't actually uh, partner with the owners of the data themselves. There are typically intermediaries. Clearing houses exist in the, in the world of insurance claims. But there's a tremendous amount of de-identification and anonymization that has to occur before the data can, can leave their, their, their prem. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. I, I think, and, and to sort of play a little on what the other folks are talking about, one of the things we've seen in data overall is, is sort of the expectation of privacy in our personal lives has eroded a lot. There's similar sorts of trends happening in sort of the financial data community as well with a sense that, you know, if someone had a sense of, you know, concern about headline risk or whatever around data coming out, um, one, people are very careful to secure and ensure that there's no personal data in there. And again, it's important to recognize that for 99.9% .9 of the financial use cases in the world, there's no interest in personal stuff at all. That, that's mm -hmm. not the data you'd want. Yeah. And in fact, you want to go out of your way to make sure you don't have that because you don't want to deal with those kind of issues. Um, but again, as folks say, as people are more understanding that information is out there and, and being productized, there is a general sense that perhaps it's okay or more okay for that sort of information to be shared among groups of people. And if you aggregate it across, you know, two, three, ten, 100 folks, it doesn't become something that's even can be personally identified in any meaningful way, and that's important. But there's a lot of work that still has to be done that if I gave you a list of drugs, you wouldn't necessarily know what companies those ties out to. And it can be quite confusing because those companies get sold from one to the other. They can be distributed under different names in different countries by different amounts. By, and, and so all of that work has to get done in order to turn that data into something usable and consistent for any purpose, really. And uh, I mean, uh, I don't think I have much more to add, but uh, other than the challenges with anonymization are, are very real. Uh, and, you know, there hasn't been any, at least not that I can recall, any major scandal uh, associated with it, but I think that's always uh, in an in area yeah. that, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that you know, vendors have to be very careful. So, I guess, and excuse me for my ignorance here, but in terms of protecting the privacy and making sure the data is anonymized, whose responsibility is that? Is that the person who sells the data? Is it the 
is it a data provider that a fund might, uh, you know, partner with? Like, who, who, I guess, where on the chain is that responsibility? It's really everybody's responsibility, and I think that, you know, as somebody who now is selling data and has been in the position of being somebody consuming it, um, people need to take and are taking very strong steps to investigate all the steps in the chain before them and after them to make sure that people have the right title to the data, that they have the right controls around the data, that they have the right security around the data. You know, in, in working with healthcare data, if somebody does that, the firms that are disseminating that will actually do security checks of the people that are taking the data to ensure that like, they can't create a HIPAA violation downstream by taking that data and doing things. There's a lot of checking and, and, and carefulness because everyone is aware, I think every stage of this process is aware that for any form of data, healthcare or otherwise, um, that people need to be extremely sensitive to the fact that this is information that has the potential conceivably to be used in, in a lot of different ways and just to ensure that people are using it appropriately, that they're putting the right checks in place, that they're cleaning it appropriately, that they're doing all those things and, and everyone is responsible for that at every stage of the process. Even more so as laws get passed in Europe and other places about the right to be forgotten and the right mm -hmm. to be, all of these things have to have mechanisms in place to ensure that those continue to get propagated down the chain of data as well. So I would add, we have, we have partners that have grown up selling data into, or, or uh, curating data into the enterprise. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the most uh, widely known use of our data is into marketing, ad tech, marketing technology companies, and that's how you know, they target us with advertising. Uh, Google and Facebook own the lion's share of that market. Google and Facebook don't sell data, but in a roundabout way they do, because when they're presenting an advertising opportunity to an enterprise client, they're presenting a lot of data and the ability to target specific individuals in, mm -hmm. even to that level. Uh, a lot of these companies that grow up marketing data into corporations, when they decide to enter into the world of financial investment management, uh, they are pretty surprised about how stringent in our case, how we are, how our client base is, how stringent and how compliant we are, because once they cross that divide into investment management, they're now operating within the realm of federal securities laws. Mm -hmm. So it's a completely different animal. So when you talk about the use of personal data and the things that are being done with that data into uh, advertising agencies, marketing tech, ad tech, uh, what we do pales in comparison. I mean, now that said, you know, we have our own diligence process that we've developed over the last 18 years. I like to think that we, we, we wrote the book on it and uh, we actually will go to a prospective data partner, we will investigate all of their sources of the data to ensure that that data is not only being, is being sourced in accordance with say GDPR or CCPA, which comes into effect in several weeks, uh, but that it's being sourced in compliance with things like the Apple app developer privacy policy. Even though that's not a law, a governmental or, regula or regulation, that's something that dictates how data can be collected and potentially distributed or not. And if a, if a vendor is in violation of that policy, Apple's own policy and is sourcing information in violation of that policy, there is the potential for that information to be considered material non-public information. Mm. So I think a lot of vendors really fail to understand the dynamic of what it means to enter into investment management. And I think our clients understand it, uh, but it's on us to make sure that the reps and warranties that they're giving us are actually true. Ultimately, from a legal standpoint, it's on them, but we wanna, we wanna you know, make sure that what they're saying is actually accurate. Mm -hmm. And so if you say that would be for like an app, if like somebody developed an app and got data that was available on the Apple store? In, in that example? example, that would be for an app. So Apple changed their Apple app developer privacy policy mm -hmm. about a year and a half ago. And that made a lot of the data that was being sourced via apps unusable by us because we, we cannot accept data that is sourced in violation of the Apple app developer privacy policy, for example. That's just one example of many. Mm -hmm. uh, now we take a very conservative view on compliance because uh, we like what we do and we like our freedom. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, so most may not, or some do not. Uh, we're kind of on the extreme, but we view that as the, the right place to be because the regulatory construct for what we do is still evolving. And we want to make sure that as it, it, as it evolves and as it's implemented, that we are way far on the right side of whatever comes to be. Mm -hmm. I, I'd be curious from your perspective if, you know, looking at the different data sets that have been available, if you found some are more useful than others, and if you could sort of walk me through, maybe at a high level even, sort of how you evaluate what's worth putting down, I don't know, $200,000 for a data set or whatever, whatever these costs might be for in, 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 some, in some cases. Sure. It, um, you know, I think it really depends upon on the use case, uh, you know, whether it's for investment strategy, risk management, or uh, a lot of what, you know, a lot of the data sets that we, uh, we looked at uh, revolved around um, unstru unstructured data and how to connect unstructured data, meaning, um, you know, various types of text, um, you know, names, entities, things of that nature to um, particular assets, uh, whether they be stocks, bonds currencies, things like that, and, uh, you know, there, there are many different providers of you know, different types of data, um, but it, I think it's important. You generally have a fairly good understanding of your use case, like what you specifically need it for, and quite often a lot of what's available uh, is very broad, and it may not fit your specific use case in total, and you know, parts of it may, and so you don't necessarily want to spend a large amount of money if you're only going to be using 10 to 15 percent of what's available. And so you try to, you know, source the, the appropriate types of data which, which meet your, your specific use, uh, but also uh, in a way that uh, is cost effective. And it may, may mean, you know, the back and forth negotiation in this case. Uh, but the, um, I think it really, it's really driven by, by your specific needs. Uh, you know, your specific strategies, you know, for example, are you, uh, a, 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 you know, an arbitrage fund, are you a global macro, uh, where you're, you may be much more interested in economic-based uh, data sets and data sets that feed into, uh, you know, understanding market regimes uh, in one way, shape, or form. Uh, but it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's generally an ongoing discussion, and I think, I think you eventually develop a strong understanding with, with your team, you know, what type of domain expertise you have and what specific sets of data you know, meet your specific needs. I think maybe to take that one step a little further, and again to allude to something Michael said earlier, one of the biggest concerns around working with data isn't just the check that you write, but it's also the amount of time it takes to evaluate it and realizing the time of people is worth a lot. And I think especially when people think about quantitative data analysis and we sort of evolve to a place where generally speaking, most quants have an expectation that all, all the historical data will be delivered to them free of charge um, so that they can figure out whether in fact there's value in it and they can build a system to trade it going forward. And people often look at that and they go, why would we give you data for free? And the answer is, well, one, we can't pay you unless you do. But then the second part of the question is, look, it's not free to us and that if we have five researchers that are vastly expensive people spending a lot of time on this, there's actually a real cost to doing that. And I think it's important to recognize that the people cost is almost always the most important cost of doing something. But as uh, Garage was alluding to, every single use case is different. And when a quant evaluates data, they have a process that ideally back tests it and says, look, here's the value we would have recognized with this data. This is the value we recognized without it. And so for them, ideally, it's quite easy for them to look at something and say, is it worth $200,000? Well, if we made $200,000 and one cent, presumably that may have value to them. From a fundamental perspective, you know, a fundamental investor thinks about data and says, well, normally when I get regular information, I sit around and I think about stuff, and then I make some choices. Well, when you sit around and think about stuff with this other stuff, do you feel better? How does that work? And it's about really being more methodical in that process and saying, how can you really understand that value? Or are you just trusting, you know, the PM or the analyst or whomever to say, I feel like this is the right amount. This is worth, you know, $20,000 worth of Shake Shack hamburgers to me that I'm not going to buy to feel better about this and have this information. And then when we look at risk systems and things like that, there's far more holistic questions of, look, if it makes a more robust risk system, what's the value of that? You know, coming from a hedge fund that went through some, you know, very visible challenges in the last year, 
around global warming and, and challenges with the wildfires in California. Had there been data that it was wildly predictive of that and you know, the, the value of the fund that isn't there anymore, virtually any cost would have justified getting data that would have been a forward-looking look into that because ultimately it ended up costing you know, on the order of 10 plus billion dollars to Blue Mountain in, in opportunity cost that was, that was lost. And so understanding how to measure and evaluate all those things, that's what makes this sort of data so interesting, is that historically we didn't have information that could inform those things, and going forward it's about what sort of information can we bring to the table that can. You make an interesting point about climate data, and I'm curious if that has entered, or was it already in the universe of data that funds were looking at? We weren't, but working on it now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we employ a very, uh, thorough process around weather data as it pertains to restaurants, retailers, uh, grocers, coffee chains, et cetera. But it's just one piece of the story that we're telling our clients about a given company. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that you asked earlier about new data, um, so one of, our, one of our strategic goals is to continue to broaden out. Like Evan mentioned, Asia, Europe. So we are in Asia, we are in Europe, we're, we have product solutions for European and, and Asia-based investors uh, in local markets. But we also want to do more with what we've always done. So if you look at U.S. consumer, for example, whereas three or so years ago we were accurately predicting the quarterly revenue for Walmart, which is a massive undertaking in and of itself. We've been incredibly accurate for probably about 24 quarters at this point. Um, but now we're layering in basket level detail so we can see how Walmart's grocery business is performing. Uh, we're layering in the visibility into how their online business is performing versus offline. Uh, of course, we're looking at weather by store with eight to 10 years of history. Uh, we're scraping the web to look at pricing or promotional cadence to see if they're heavily discounting as an indication of how healthy their business is performing. Uh, among other things. So, you know, the pre-existing work that we did or the pre-existing coverage has become much, much more robust. Uh, and I think you have to do that to stay ahead, but also uh, the data availability. So I always talk about the proliferation of data availability, which I think we're, we're going through that now, uh, given that we have a lot of choices and options. But that's really what we need to tell a complete story. So our industry has evolved from predicting quarterly revenue to now actually going deeper into the investment thesis and the various drivers of business performance that matter to investors. Mm -hmm. Is there, I guess, consensus at this point um, how data has affected performance for hedge funds? Or is there, if you guys have any thoughts just generally on, on that topic. I can start. Um I, I, I'm not so sure if there's a consensus on whether or how it's affected hedge funds, but I think it certainly uh, had the business model or even the sort of the investment model that most hedge funds has has evolved uh, over the past several years. Uh, you know, I, I recall years ago when when we were looking at data, for example, uh, in, in the options market, implied volatility skews, things like that. You load it into a, an Excel spreadsheet. You know. Uh, you know, run some models around that, and, and you know, get, get an indication of you know where where bid ask spreads, where bid ask uh, you know volatility should be across a broad array of assets, and it was very time consuming, <clears throat> and uh, you know you needed a team of and I think it, uh, Evan mentioned earlier you needed a team of people, a team of data engineers to pre-process a lot of that data and get it into a format which was useful. Uh, nowadays you have firms like Condor, you know, which uh, provides a great platform for uh, for data. Uh, which is readily available. And I think it's allowed funds to uh, look at enormous amounts of data, which they couldn't uh, in years past, uh, and in a much more efficient way, and develop uh, either, you know, test existing, you know, these type of data sets with their existing strategies, or potentially even develop new strategies, uh, you know, more or less in align with what they're, what they're currently doing. So it, I think it's allowed, uh, you know, a much greater degree of freedom in uh, looking at the different uh, potential factors which can affect asset prices because there's so much more data available. I mean, there's definitely an arms race element to data overall that I mean, certainly the, the, the bar has been raised to be just 
performing and, and things people need in order to stay ahead of things. I think increasingly we've seen, you know, in advance of earnings, in advance of various things, you, you will definitely see certain data sets that uh, when they release new information, the market moves and it's very clear that that's causing that and so that, that cycle has moved up. It isn't always about new information. Sometimes it's about the information we always had, but sooner. Um, at the same time, you know, th there are a number of funds that have been very visibly successful at working with data in a new and interesting kind of way. And I think the challenge for everybody is to continue to evolve that use case and say, how do you do more with it sooner? How do you take it in interesting ways? I think, you know, overall, and, and Michael and Julie Quandle seen this as well, um, you know, beyond just the hedge fund use case, seeing private equity firms and corporates and other folks like that and, you know, salad companies in New York and pizza places and other parts of the country that are going out and, and coming to data conferences and are looking to acquire new information to help out their business. And the fact that data is on a going forward basis likely to be something that's pretty universal really across every business. Mm -hmm. And it becomes the people that are more able to work with that and able to see where the puck is going and do those kind of things are likely to be the ones that have the more information and the ability to be more successful a long time ago to get you know, differentiated information, you had to have a huge amount of size and go to somebody that was really important and partner with them. Now you can acquire it from a lot of places and do more with it if you have the wherewithal and the desire and the ability to go do that. So it's really the opportunity is immense. Mm -hmm. So I think there's empirical evidence that uh, hedge funds, mutual funds, and hedge funds of all types of strategies mm -hmm. that have been early movers, and uh, on the leading edge of data adoption as part of their research process have outperformed. Uh, I know it because I know who our clients are and I know who the outperformers are. It's not something that we can talk about publicly. I wish we could because it is empirical. Uh, but we see that across major long onlys. We see it now in the private equity world. Uh, and of course, we see it in long short discretionary. And it's not just your faster money uh, you know, the likely suspects that you would probably name if asked, uh, but it's also your very longer term uh, hedge funds that some would refer to as closet long onlys. Uh, and it also applies to uh, strategies like activism. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the major activist investors uh, and who's performed and who has not, it's not a coincidence that those who have performed have uh, adopted a, a data strategy and put some real dollars behind that strategy. So for the, the more longer term investors, so they will their PE fund or um, say an activist fund, how are they using data that in a different way than say more you know, fast trading type of firms? Yeah, so for, for activism, uh, it's very helpful when you're going into a proxy fight to be armed with empirical information. And that information may be at the fingertips of the management team that you're potentially battling against but it, it's very helpful if you have your own set of, of data, of information. Uh, it makes, I think, for a much more productive conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, in PE, it's essentially on the diligence side. So if you're looking at a prospective investment, you want to learn as much as you can about that company, their peers, how they're faring against their, their competitive set, but also learn a lot more about their, the, cons the customers of the business. And then beyond that, once if the transaction is consummated, uh, we will typically then drop down and consult the individual company, so the target company, uh, to help them better understand their competitors and their customers. It's also very much a question of scale. I think like, when you think about you know a standard long short hedge fund, if they're making you know a bet for a number of weeks or maybe a number of months, and it's you know a few million dollars, there's an amount of data investment that may make sense. If you're likely to be owning something, you know, to the hundreds of millions of dollars for years and years and years, you can build out a really full-fledged process through data that can cover almost every facet of the business. It's a question of whether there's value and time and opportunity in doing that. So I think as people continue to find more use cases and in some of the spaces Michael was alluding to, um, really it just gives the chance to do more with it and say, you know, for somebody who's, who's going to be in and out of the name in 10 minutes, there's questions that just don't make sense. There's things that can't affect that time horizon, but over a span of years, and if you have management interest and ability to really inform the business, you can get into all the minutia of everything, and, and there's value in doing that, and the cost of you know $100,000 worth of data against that is really pretty minimal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. With, um, you know, for longer-term strategies, the, 
the number of factors uh, involved can, can be quite large, uh, and particularly when you're building positions for you know, months to potentially even years. Uh, there is a lot of, lot of data build, uh, that goes into building you know, models for those types of positions, and I think each one of those input factors, there can be an entire sets of data around it. Um, you know, for example, if you're looking at, uh, you know, we were talking about climate change earlier, you know, how, what are the factors that are driving climate change and how do those factors feed into agricultural companies, uh, equipment manufacturers, so on and so forth. Uh, there are a number of funds who take very long-term positions around these type of themes and, and it's, it would really benefit them uh, to, the, to the ones that aren't using uh, you know, data uh, in this way uh, to look at all the types of data which can play into those factors. Um, am I allowed to ask the audience if they have any questions? I'm just, I'm gonna just do it. Does anybody, <laughs> does anybody have uh, any questions for my panel? You can have the mic. You can ask anything you want. Oh man, okay, well we'll just have to keep talking then. Um, yes. Well, considering Michael works for M Science, I'm going to kick that one over to Evan. <laughs> I, I think the two challenges you run into with alternative data and, and talking to clients is really twofold. I think one, there's folks that just come come at things from the point of view of all this new data. It's not saying anything we didn't already know. And I guess one of the challenges that I have in that is the fundamental data that exists out in the world kind of hasn't really changed since I don't know maybe the mid '80s. And so it, it, if somebody's really going and saying that I think the financial markets knew everything as of, you know, 30 years ago, and we've learned nothing since then, and nothing has, like, delivered information more quickly or, 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 or in a more robust way or more granular. Um, I, I, I believe the technical term for that is you're fucking insane. Um, there's just no way that's true. Um, but then people will say, look, you know, how do I work with it? There's challenges. That I get, and that's totally valid. And I think the other question we get a lot is, you know, what actually is alternative data? And, and, and the honest answer to that is it's different to all sorts of different people. The data in investment we think of as traditional data would be very alternative for a corporation. People reading equity research reports from a bank is the most regular fundamental use case ever, but if you take that, run natural language processing on top of it and feed it into a computer, that's actually a pretty new use case for a quantitative manager. To take sentiment data on news um, is something that's you know, pretty much bread and butter for a quant guy, and to give that to a fundamental person who obviously can read the news, but to parse you know, a huge range of news and deliver that to them in a useful format, that's pretty cutting edge for them. And so it really becomes what's meaningful, what's useful, but I think the real fundamental challenge that a lot of people have in thinking about this data is it just has to do with how they think about data overall. And the fact that they say, you know, how do I understand if there's value in this? How do I know if it, it, it's useful? And if you think about your investment process, um, you probably, you, you track the trades you make. In many cases, you don't track the trades you don't. And so if there's data that says, hey, maybe you shouldn't do something, and then you don't do something, do you track to see if that data was right? Did, you know, people will often come to the table and say, tell me about some alternative data and the time you had a 10 base hit. When was the last time you had a 10 base hit in fundamental data? That's just luck. Um, but saying, how do you do better off and saying, how do you improve the process overall by 5% across the board? That's really what you should be aiming for in working with more interesting stuff. It's about doing better in the process consistently. You know, I could go out and throw a no-hitter tomorrow because I could be crazy lucky, but at the same time, I'm not gonna, you know, be a 300 hitter in Major League Baseball because I'm not any good. But data can improve a little bit across the board. Getting lucky is just getting lucky. So. I don't know if that speaks to different elements of the question. But. I think that's a great point about, you know, you, you don't know uh, what you, if you didn't do it, it's hard to measure, but I, I don't think. It's easy to measure, we just have to actually measure it. Right. Well, I don't think, I don't think the industry gets enough credit for the, the good misses. Um, my two cents would be, we're disrupting an industry, and it's an industry where people are highly compensated. So naturally, whenever you're disrupting an industry where things have been performed in the same way for half of a century, and I'm talking about the investment research process, it hasn't changed much until the onset of the use of data uh, 50, 60, 70 years. Uh, whenever you're doing that, you're gonna run into obstacles because these are highly compensated people that prefer the status quo. 
Uh, so I think uh, over time, people are starting to realize that it's not something that can be ignored. There's real alpha there. There's real performance there. Uh, but it takes, it takes a lot longer with some than others. Can I just give you the mic? Because I think for everyone else to be able to hear. Thanks. Um, there didn't seem to be much discussion on, um, on, um, on Capitol Hill and policy perspectives. It seems like, you know, you have the, both the FANG um, executives and the financial services um, um, executives going before Congress and Senate. Um, so some of these topics touching privacy and, and the like, um, how should those elected officials and their staffs be better informed, better briefed towards some of these pretty technical matters? I mean, I think it's, you, you, have, you have legislators who are well-informed, and then sometimes you have legislators that are not particularly well-informed. So I think at the end of the day, what they're trying to do is, uh, in, in, in the spirit of helping individuals and ensuring that individuals, that their privacy rights are protected. That said, uh, we are fully in favor of more regulation versus less. So. For example, when GDPR came out, uh, we were completely unaffected because we had already been operating well beyond the standards of GDPR. Similarly, we're expecting the same with CCPA. Uh, inevitably, you're going to have some, some who will overshoot. Uh, you'll have some who just don't fully understand the complexities of data. And, you know, I think, as Evan alluded to earlier, I think the key is really as consumers realize that their data can act as a currency and that these wonderful services that they use every single day to communicate globally with their family and friends are truly not for free. Uh, the currency is how they pay. Their data is their currency to pay for these services. I think as more and more people wake up to that, you'll see, uh, you'll see comfort with that transaction or the nature of that transaction, but you'll also probably see some sort of monetization engine or engines emerge uh, where consumers can actually monetize their data, that monetize that actual currency and then use it to buy services. And, and just to sort of, you know, maybe take a little further what Michael was saying, I think anyone who operates in our business is uniquely unsurprised by any of the data breaches and any of the notifications that come out about companies and information they're making available, because in many cases, a lot of us have seen that data in a variety of places being offered to us for sale. Having said that, um, I'm perfectly happy to let Google monetize my data. Google Maps is the most useful thing ever for me getting around personally, like, ever. And so I think it's just about understanding and have even people that are very aware of all of the implications of this are perfectly happy to have their data be used by people for a variety of things and a variety of use cases. It's just about understanding what that is and saying it's okay. I think, if anything, it's about having clear regulations so we know what we need to do and not do. And ideally about having a well-informed group of people who say, look, here's, here's where I'm comfortable, here's where I'm not, here are things that are appropriate, here are things that are not. But ultimately, I don't think it, it kills an ecosystem. I think, if anything, the more people understand it, the more you say, look, it, it's healthy and it's operating. And there's no reason why any of these use cases are necessarily bad. They're just ill understood. Some of them are bad, but that's because there are people that are just doing things that make no sense. There's no reason a flashlight app should have to know where you are. But there's plenty of other things that make perfect sense. Okay, I think I'm, I'm going to wrap it up now. I think that's, that's at our, we're at our limit. But uh, thank you to my panelists for coming today, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you.